Good morning. Good to see you this morning in our uh, daily Genesis Bible study. God's richest blessings to you today. Uh, it's a beautiful day, at least it was this morning, and it's good to be with you. And the rains came down and the floods came up. The rain came down and the floods came up. So this, you know, this story that we sing this song all the time about, uh, you know, this rain that happened and Noah in the ark and all that, you know, there's a dark side to the story. We'll get into that today. Um, but anyway, it's good to be with you today. Uh, it's uh, it's Friday, June uh, 5th, and uh, we're getting ready to go into the weekend. And uh, we're having a communion service on Sunday. And so I'm hoping I get to see some of you on Sunday. That would be so exciting. Um, uh, can't give you a hug. Can only say hi, but at least we can see each other or maybe maybe give each other a virtual hug or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, I've started to do this thing where we call out birthdays. We have one birthday, not today, but it's tomorrow. It's Logan Kaczynski. So he was one of the guys that went with the youth group to uh, the last youth retreat. And uh, he's a wonderful young man, just graduated from high school. So his birthday's tomorrow. Uh, anniversaries, uh, we don't actually track anniversaries. We should probably do that, but there's at least one major anniversary on Sunday, and that is mine. <laughs> 34 years this Sunday, can you believe it? And I won the lottery on that one, so uh, definitely uh, very excited about that. So thank you, Hun, for putting up with me for 34 years, uh, or however many years you put up with me. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Coronavirus. We haven't really done a coronavirus update, but I just wanted to kind of let you know a couple things. Let's see if I can even do this. Um, where was the coronavirus? It was right there. Okay, just, just take a look at this. This is the chart from Pima County, and these are the things that have to happen according to the federal guidelines. And what we would like is all these things to be in the green. So basically, that the disease data, uh, all three of these are in the green, that the healthcare system availability is in the green. And as you can see, uh, these, there's no more reds, there's a couple yellows. Uh, decreasing cases over 14 days and decreasing hospitalizations. So those are apparently not decreasing yet. Uh, then we have lab test availability and util utilization. Um, that one is in the yellow. Adequate hospital bed is in the green. Sufficient PPE, personal protective equipment, is in the yellow. Uh, gosh, I got to think that that's got to be getting into the green pretty soon. I We've been able to see uh, masks free up and sanitizers, you know, hang free up. All this stuff that was kind of a run on originally, I think I've, I'm seeing that it's starting to get available now. And then the last one is the tracking of this uh, testing and, and case, you know, Case investigation, which is the, the tracking, testing and tracking. Uh, the testing is not quite available yet. So now what does this all mean really though? Um, because uh, th this is the federal guidelines. We, the things we follow are the federal guidelines of the CDC, right? The CDC says right now, no, no groups greater than 10. But as, you know, as, as things start to look better, uh, you know, you might be able to get in groups of, of 50 and then maybe it's 100 or 200. Right now, the governor has said that churches can get together as long as they're less than 50. But that's pressure on because of religious freedom. But that doesn't necessarily change the whole fact that um, that uh, we're still in the middle of a pandemic that doesn't have a treatment or cure uh, or, a, you know, a treatment or a cure or anything. So. Uh, should we follow the CDC guidelines? Should we go ahead and meet because the governor says it's okay? Well, the governor isn't saying it's okay necessarily because of the CDC. He's saying it's okay because of the pressure for churches to be able to meet together. So, and, you know, I have no problem if a church wants to meet together. Uh, I just pray that they keep people safe, as safe as possible. If you had a church that had 100,000 square feet uh, and you kept people six feet apart in family groups, maybe you could get together. But the, what we're finding is that the churches that are opening up, they're at about 30, 40, 30 to 40 percent capacity, and it just feels so different. It almost feels like, um, it, I mean, it's it's kind of defeating. You get to church, and you're expecting to see all the people that you normally see at church, and you only get to see about a third to you know to 25 percent of them, and it's like, man, 
this just doesn't feel like church. Um, so I'm taking all this into consideration. And, uh, and th there's a, another thing that, that happened uh, yesterday that I thought was really fascinating. Because I was thinking, you know, we either have to have a treatment or a cure, uh, or we have to have, uh, you know, testing or whatever, all these things that we need to have before we can, uh, before we can open up. But there was one thing I saw yesterday uh, on a podcast that was really fascinating. And it's a researcher, and he's been looking at the data that are starting to come in. Because when we first locked down, we had no data. It was all coming out of China, which wasn't clear and concise. But now we've got data from all around the world, and we're looking at that data. There's lots of people looking at that data. And what this guy has found out is that based upon that data that he's seeing in Europe, that, like, for example, in the United Kingdom, there's a minimum of about 50% of the population in the United Kingdom, for whatever reason, he's not sure yet why, appear to be immune to this. And in Germany, where it's really high, it may be 70 to 80% are immune to this disease. Well, that is an interesting finding. We may not know why they're immune, but we know that there's immunity, which means, because one of the things that can really reduce the spread of this virus is called herd immunity, which is you get enough people where they can't get the disease and all of a sudden the disease has harder pathways to get through people. Well, if indeed there are parts of Europe that are 50%, 70% immune already, that means we're very close to a herd immunity. Uh, so that would then need to go back into the model and then they run the models again and they figure out, okay, what does this all mean? Because it may mean that in some areas of the country, because of herd immunity, for whatever reason, if uh, you know, if they can figure out what percentage, let's say, of Pima County is already immune, uh, that may, might dramatically shift the model and, and, it, and the disease gets closer and closer to herd immunity and it might change things also. So uh, I wasn't anticipating that that could be something that also changes uh, over the summer. I was thinking the one thing that could change is that because in the summertime, a lot of viruses go down uh, in infect infectiousness that maybe that would happen here in Arizona. But the other thing that could happen, it wasn't even my radar screen, is that perhaps the models will be adjusted and the models will say, okay, maybe it's not 10 people, maybe it's 50 people, maybe it's 100 people. I mean, that would be great if we could get to 100 people. Uh, you couldn't do large events like movie theaters or you know stadiums and stuff like that, but churches could probably live with 100 people. You know, A lot of churches could figure that out, at least we could. Um, and we probably could figure out 52, but that's the thing you have to understand is between each worship service, you're looking at completely cleaning the facility, which could take 45 minutes to an hour and a staff of people to do that. So that is that is where um, the challenge lies for a pastor. You know, how do you how do you get opened up so people feel safe? How do you get it so that more than 30 to 40 percent of the people show up so it feels like a worship service? I mean, it's just. There's a lot of factors in this that uh, are so difficult. And of course, uh, all those decisions come upon us and the staff and you know some key leaders. So anyway, that's where we are. Uh, now, what else? That's about it. So uh, we are into Genesis. We are, this is it, folks. This is probably the most uh, well-known story out of the Old Testament. Uh, and all the kids you know, play with Noah's arcs, but but it, is, it does have a dark side to it. And uh, that dark side is that a lot of people die. So we're going to just go ahead and get into it. Genesis 7, starting at verse 6. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his son's wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark, as God had commanded Noah. And after the seven days, the flood waters came on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the seventh day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. And rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. 
So uh, this is it. Uh, the rain started coming. Noah and his family go into the ark. Now, what's interesting is that what uh, Moses writes about this is that he gives some specifics as far as when this flood had occurred. It was after the. It was. Uh, it was in the six hundredth year of Noah's life, on the seventeenth day of the second month. Now, believe it or not, uh, that we live with what's called the Gregorian calendar. Uh, Pope Gregory developed this calendar to figure out all the church years. Uh, I don't. Some. I want to say maybe six hundred year, six hundred AD. I don't know when that was, but. Uh, but we live on a calendar that's been going around for about a thousand, you know, 1500 years, thousand years. I'm not exactly sure. But before uh, Pope Gregory finalized this uh, and before they had telescopes and before, you know, all these things uh, happened, the way that people marked time was through the lunar calendar. And the lunar calendar is based upon the moon and the cycles of the moon. And there are still cultures around the world that still follow the lunar calendar. As a matter of fact, I think Islam still follows the lunar calendar. Now, the lunar cal if you've ever followed the lunar calendar, uh, or if you've ever even thought about it, the moon rises and sets uh, every 29 and a half days. So uh, it's not a full 30 days. It's not 29 days. It's 29 and a half days. So... Uh, it's just kind of a really bizarre calendar that we have with the lunar calendar. Um, and uh, so you calculate the full moon and you go 30 days. Uh, and that might have changed a little bit. You know, people who do the lunar calendar now call it 30 days. But it, it was just between the full moons, right? And, um, and that was kind of one cycle. And... Uh, Basically, in the Hebrew calendar, those full moon cycles began. It was like the first full moon after, uh, I would say, the first full moon after uh, the equinox, which which is what that's uh, March March twenty eighth or something like that is the first is the full moon equinox. So we still do this a little bit. Easter for us is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. And the spring equinox is when the day and night, the time for both day and night are identical, right? Uh, so that's the equinox. It's when when everything is kind of balanced in our, in our system. And that's also the beginning of spring, right? And so uh, the first month in the Hebrew calendar was basically would be the first full moon after the spring equinox. I mean, roughly. It might it, we have exact things now that we can tell when the equinox says they didn't have that in the Jewish calendar. So it was a guess for them. So you basically had that was the first month and that would happen about the end of March to the end of May. Right. And then the second month would be the end of uh, I'm sorry, March, April, March to April, April to May would be the second month. So roughly speaking, uh, somewhere in that time period is when the second month was so and this was apparently the 17th day of the second month so this would be if you figure uh you know at the end of march so april 1st is so you're looking for the full moon let's say it comes april 10th uh and that goes for 30 days then you're looking at may 10th and then you have seven days after that is 17 days after that is the end of may so roughly you know roughly speaking the end of may is when this thing happened uh, and so uh, what happens in the in this time period? Well, a lot of places around the world, you're starting to get spring, right? And you're starting to get spring rains. Uh, and so this is when this is when these floods came. Actually, I have I have a little chart here, or a couple charts that, that talk about the Hebrew calendar. Let's see if I can figure this out. Yeah. So um, in the Hebrew calendar, you have the two months, Nisan and Iyar. The Canaanite names are Abib and Ziv, and it's the latter rains, you know, the barley harvest and the general harvest uh, planting, uh, and then you have Passover. So, and this is somewhere around April or May. Uh, this is the latter rains, but it's springtime. And then after springtime, you have the dry season, and that's May, June, June, July, July, August, August, September, September, October. 
And they've named these months, Sivan, Tammuz, Ab, Elul, Tishri. Um, these are the months of the summer. And you can see the festivals that happen there. And then you have the months of Marchezv and Chislev. That's the early rains. Uh, and that's, uh, so where are we? We can go back and see. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine months. So, you know, my, nine, huh, we can't call them months. We can call them cycles of the moon. Uh, and then you have Tabeth, Shabbat, and Adar. And then it says here, Adar, second Adar, which is interesting because um, because it's uh, because it's 30 days roughly between full moons uh, and you calculate it out, it's not enough. It's not enough days to fill out the year. The days get the, the cycles get a little bit closer. I mean, the moons get farther apart, but the cycles get closer. And so every so many numbers of years around the sun, you have to add an extra full moon cycle because that full moon cycle uh, shifts around. And so uh, maybe every seven or eight years, you might have to add another full moon cycle. So you get to uh, the equinox, you've already done 12 months and you're like, man, we still need another month. And so you add every periodically, you'd add another month of full moons and then you'd start over again. You'd have a late after the full moon, and then it would start to get closer and closer. So uh, every every few years, uh, you'd have to add another cycle of moons between, you know, to add to make it seem reasonable. Uh, so it is tough for us, unless we know the exact year that this happened, we can't go back in time and figure out an exact date. It's just impossible. And I think there was a guy named Bishop Usher, who you know took all the dates of people in the Bible and tried to go back and figure out an exact date for the flood, like what date was that? And then using that and you know astronomy and all that, he tried to figure out okay, where were we in this solar in the lunar cycle and figure all that out. But it's all speculation. There's really no way. There's no way to know for sure um, what that was. Uh, so the floods came. Uh, Seven days, the floodwaters came on the earth uh, in the 600th year of Noah's life. Now, that's another interesting thing. It was the 600th year of Noah's life. Remember, they lived a lot longer back then. So you have to ask yourself, what about Noah's father? Was he possibly alive? Uh, was Noah's mother alive? Was his brothers and sisters alive? I mean, when Noah went under the ark, how many of his family members did he, did he kill? Um, now we can go back into Genesis four or five and look at uh, the lineage, and it turns out that that lineage that Noah's father was Lamech, and he lived to be seven hundred and seventy-seven years old, and Noah was born uh, when Lamech was one hundred and eighty-two years old. So if you take seven hundred seventy-seven years minus out uh, one hundred and eighty-two years, you get five ninety-five. So basically. Noah, his father died when Noah was 595 years old. And then the floods came when Noah was 600 years old. So basically, Noah's father had been dead five years when the flood waters came. And maybe that was a graceful thing for, for Noah to not have to kill his father. Um, it certainly seems to me to be a gracious thing. The, the power of, of your father was very, 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 very strong in the Old Testament. The whole lineage and your history, honor your mother and your father, all of that was very, very powerful. Your connection to life itself was through your lineage and your parents. We put all these genealogies in the Bible because it's so important to know who your father is and your grandfather and your great-grandfather, all these things. It was very, very important. Uh, it's still important to me today not as much to a lot of people in our culture. Uh, for some reason, uh, we don't, in, in other cultures around the world, parents, you know, when they get old, they live with their kids, right? I mean, that is just what parents do. For some reason here in the United States, maybe it's because our parents are healthier, they have uh, social security or whatever. We let them kind of have as much independence as they want. And then it's the last few years of life that we got to figure out what to do with them. Um, 
uh, that's a crude way to say, uh, as a society, because there are many, many, many people that, that just absolutely, you know, they'll do anything to be with their parents, to let their parents come live with them. I mean, and even the United States and a lot of cultures around the world, but here in the United States, it's very different from around the world. Uh, my father is 85 and I think probably he's got He's very independent and he's doing very, very well. So uh, I figure, you know, at some point in the next five to 10 years, we will have to figure out how that's all going to be solved. And I would love it if my dad would come and live with me. It would be difficult, <laughs> but uh, it would be a blessing too. I mean, it'd be a huge blessing because I just really love my father. Anyway, so Noah didn't have to kill his dad. That's a blessing. But so Noah is 600 years. And then on that day, here, take a look at this. Uh, right at the bottom, uh, uh, verse 11. In the 600th, month, uh, 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and the rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So basically, uh, it, the rain came down, but the springs of the great deep burst forth. Now, this is interesting because it means if you read this quite literally, which not everybody does, but if you read it literally, um, that means that rain came down, but the springs of the great deep burst forth, which means it wasn't just the rain, but there were springs out of the earth, like there was this latent amount of water somewhere that burst up out of the ground and also lifted the ark and caused this great flood. Because if you think about it, if you flood a lot, you know, one inches or two inches an hour, for, I mean, it's still not necessarily enough water to completely cover the whole entire region. And remember, uh, they, we have, we know now the earth is round. But back then, they did not know the earth was round. All they could see was as far as they could see. And as far as they could see, everything was flooded. And it was flooded uh, very much. Uh, and is there enough rain to be able to, can enough rain come out of the sky to do that? Well, according to Genesis, it not only came out of the sky, but it, the great springs of the deep burst forth. So this makes you go, hmm, let's think about this for a minute. Uh, was there something else going on besides just the rain coming down? And one of the theories that has been posited by people who've thought about this is that maybe there was a lake that was a natural man-made lake. You know, the rain came uh, and, uh, the, uh, and filled up the lake and then there was a dam, a natural dam in that rain that held that lake water back quite a bit. I mean, if you think about all the lakes that are above Phoenix, there's like 13 lakes and all of them are filled with water. And what happens when the rain comes, we have to let that water out a lot so that it doesn't overtop the dam because once it overtops the dam, the dam can break. And then all of a sudden, now you have all that water filling the area. So some people have thought, well, maybe there was a natural lake. Uh, some have even thought the Straits of Bosphorus right there, you know, with uh, the Mediterranean Sea and Turkey, uh, that maybe that was like a natural dam at one point. Uh, but then it, there was on this rain, there was so much pressure of rain, you know, filling up that natural man-made lake uh, from the man-made that it topped over the dam, you know, a once in a 500, once in a thousand year event. And as it topped over the dam, all that water broke loose. And so now you not only have the rainwater, but you have the floodwaters from the dam. And to Noah, that would have looked like the springs of the great deep bursting forth, right? Like all this water is just rising in all of the rivers that have never risen before. Uh, and um, that could be if it was a large enough lake. If you think of the whole entire Great Lakes uh, you know, flooding the United States, yeah, that could be a lot of rainwater that eventually just fills up everything. And the amount of energy and destruction of that would have been catastrophic. Uh, the miracle here is that God prepared Noah for it. Uh, I like to think of miracles 
as a participation between God and man, right? Uh, and the miracle here that you can look at is that Noah built an ark. God told Noah to build the ark. Noah and his family got in the ark and they were saved. And that truly is a miracle. If, if Noah had not been building the ark, uh, if, if God had not told him to build the ark, he would not have been saved if he wasn't faithful after God. So the miracle here, and, and so the flood points to an event, but it also points to God because God came to Noah and said, build the ark. So the people in the ark uh, knew of God's miracle and the people uh, who came out of the ark and created subsequent generations all knew about the flood and how it killed all mankind except for Noah and his family and all the animals. But they knew about this great event called the Great Flood. And of course, there have been archaeologists have studied and said, yeah, there have been great floods, you know, that are incredible, great floods in the ancient Near East. So the miracle is, is that, that Noah was saved, right? That God came to Noah and said, build an ark, which he did. So um, let's see, the rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And why does that uh, number stick in our head? Because 40 days and 40 nights is like 40 years in the wilderness for the Israelites. It's like uh, 40 days of Jesus when he was tempted by the devil. This time of 40 days has always been a time when God tests mankind. Uh, he tested the Israelites by remaining faithful to God and saying, I will get you through this. And, and they were impatient. Uh, they wanted to scream out. It was not a great time for them. But God says, be patient and you will get a promised land. And they did get a promised land. And here in the ark, Noah is impatient. Like, I want to, I want to, open up the door and get out. And God's like, no, uh, you can't do that yet. We have to wait. We have to wait. Um, 40 days and 40 nights has always indicated a time of uh, a time of reflection, a time of being in the presence of God, a time of not sure what's going to happen, but knowing that God's in charge. So there's 40 days and 40 nights. Now, actually, they're in the ark a lot longer than this is just the rain. The rain falls for 40 days and 40 nights, but they're in the ark a, a great deal of time more. So let's continue reading. Uh, Genesis 7, beginning verse 13. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of the three sons, entered the ark. They have with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings, pairs of all creatures, that have breath of life in them, came to Noah. They came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. For 40 days, the floods kept coming on the earth. And as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth. And the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. And by the way, I did look, um, a cubit is one and a half feet. So 15 cubits would be seven and a half, 22 and a half feet, all right? Uh, let's see, where were we? The water rose, covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 and a half feet, 20, 22 and a half feet. Every living thing that moved on land perished, birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swam over the earth, and all mankind, everything on dry land that had breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. And the waters flooded the earth for 150 days. So this is the destruction. I mean, it's kind of fun to play with the little toy arcs and have Noah and his wife and all the animals two by two. But this was a massive destruction. Um, it was horrific. Absolutely horrific. Um, 
Jennifer was telling me yesterday that, you know, we have first we have coronavirus and then we have the riots in Minnesota and across the country. And if that's not enough, apparently there's a stadium sized meteor headed towards Earth. I have no, I haven't looked it up since then to see. I mean, it could be 100 light years away for all we know. I don't know. But there's a there's a, a meteor headed straight towards us, folks. It's the size of a of a of a stadium. So maybe maybe it'll miss us. Uh, maybe not. Who knows? But destruction has always been a part of um, our world. It's part of sin. It's part of the sinful condition. The good news is here, the, the joy that we have, that mankind wasn't wiped out, is that God foretold Noah to build an ark and Noah and his family were saved. And that's a great blessing. And we'll see that God even provides more blessings after that. You probably know all and know about that blessing. Um, but destruction has always been a part of, of our world. Uh, we look at the destruction going around right now, you know, the man-made destruction from the rioting and all that sort of thing. And we, it just hurts us. It hurts us to see these things happen. But we live in a world that is not perfect. And so there's man-made disaster and there's, and there's non-made man-made disaster. And the only thing you can do when you're in the middle of these disasters is just to cling on to God, know that he loves us, knows that that he's got a greater purpose for us, that at some time, sure, we'll die, but we'll rise again with him in the resurrection and we'll live with him forever because uh, sometimes it can be overwhelming to live in a world that has so much destruction. Uh, it seems like a great thing to play with the ark, but the backstory behind it is that there was a lot of death and destruction. A lot of animals and mankind was killed through this. It was horrible. So uh, I think we'll end it there. Uh, we, uh, we have, I will see some of you over the weekend and I'm so blessed to do that. And, uh, and then we'll get again together on Monday. Uh, just so you know, kind of where we're going, my daughter is due in Chicago to have a baby on June 17th. So somewhere around June 17th or 19th for sure, I'm gonna be in, in Chicago. If the baby comes a little bit in advance of that, what were you, when the, you know, in the next 10 days, we're going to pack up and drive. Uh, at that point, um, we'll see how this Bible study goes. I might do some on the road, and I might even cancel some for a period of time uh, until I can get back to a point where I could do that. So we're going to play that all by ear because the fact is I really love this. I enjoy it a lot, uh, and it's not a lot of time. Uh, and so we just have to play it by ear. But at some point, there will be a hiatus where we're going to cancel this Bible study for a while and then we'll pick it up again once the hiatus is over. And I can tell you all about the most beautiful child ever born to mankind. So um, I guess we'll leave it there. And uh, won't you join me in prayer? Uh, dear God, thank you for saving Noah and his, and his family so that we could be born today. Uh, and thank you, Lord, that you continue to watch over our earth. Uh, be with our, be with our country in this time of stress. Uh, thank you for your church that shows your love and that's your hands and your feet. Bless us this weekend and keep us safe. And uh, we'll uh, we'll see you and uh, again on Monday. Lord, thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so. That's it. We'll see you on Monday. Uh, really, uh, oh, where am I? Oh, I don't know if I can stop this because I had to go look at the other chart. Okay, so we'll see you on Monday and God's richest blessings. Take care. Bye.